Let's talk about groups of numbers and how we can represent them in non-visualized ways. Non-visualization, non-visual ways means not graphs, but rather tables and other ways of looking at things. The learning objectives are to learn how to do this kind of thing, including looking at co data columns, which is easy, frequency tables, which is a little more complex, grouped frequency tables, slightly more complex, and then getting back to simple again, a data matrix, and you need to know how to do some basic things with a data matrix that we'll work on here. So some terminology and some organizations. When we have many similar observations, observations are these processes of looking at a thing or an event or something out there in the world and writing things down. Uh, when many similar observations came from a group of things or events or people, then we sometimes call that a variable, right? But the things or the events that we observed, we call them cases or individuals or subjects or participants. And then the characteristic itself is a variable, as we've mentioned before. If the variable is numeric or numerical, I don't know the difference between those words, then all the values considered together as a whole are sometimes called a distribution. And we use that term distribution specifically when we're talking about a pattern in the values rather than just the values themselves as a whole. So a basic principle that you need to be reminded of about 2,000 times, according to my slides, is that the nature of the data, data determines the treatment of the data. You can't get good answers from data unless you treat the data in a way that respects what it is. So most of what's in this lecture shouldn't be done with categorical data. Um, although there is an exception. Frequency tables can be done very nicely with categorical data. We'll talk about that. So when we have a group of numbers, if we were computers, we wouldn't need to do anything with them. We could just, I don't know, I imagine future AIs or something. We could just kind of say, oh, well, I have the whole thing in my head. Why do I need to do anything with it? But we're humans. We need to organize the numbers in ways that humans can understand and make sense of because a wall of numbers is not terribly enjoyable. So here's a, a one way to organize data in an extremely rudimentary fashion, but very useful. It's a data column. When we're recording information by hand, or when we're just writing it down to do some quick stats on one variable, this is the most common thing we do. We just write things in a vertical column and put the name of the variable at the top. Um, if we don't know what the name of the variable is, or it doesn't really have a name because it's abstract, we usually write X, because that's our default variable name in statistics. Sometimes we sort or order those things, uh, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes there are reasons not to. And sometimes there's just no point to waste that extra time if you're doing things by hand. Now one step up from that is a frequency table. And this is extremely useful and extremely common and pretty easy. In R, in fact, the function for it is just a single word, table. So you list each possible value that it could occur in your data. And you remember that those are the categories. You don't leave any gaps in the sequence if there's an order to them. So if it's a numerical system or an ordered system, there will be a natural order to things. Don't leave any gaps in the sequence. So even if a particular category is not represented in your data, put the name of the category there first. So you're going to make one column first of each possible value. And then in the next column right next to that, matched up with those values, is the number of times each of those values appears in your data set, even if it appears zero times. Like if you put a number in there because you're just putting the entire sequence up, up in front of you. And the number of times is called frequency. We just abbreviate it with F because we use that term so frequently. <laughs> frequently. Yeah, that is not even really a joke. It was so dumb. So this works for both numerical and categorical variables, although for unordered categorical variables, you don't have to worry about putting things in any order because there isn't any order. Although maybe you should think about the order you put them in. Sometimes it helps for people reading. So here's an example. Here are some survey responses. First question, what level of measurement is this? Here's a frequency table of those survey responses. 10 people said they strongly agreed with the, with the statement. 10 people said they only agreed. 5 said they neither agreed nor disagreed. 3 said they disagreed. And 2 said they strongly disagreed. Now that second column, percentage, that's the percent of responses that each of these represents. There are 30 responses, so 10 of them is a third, or 33.33%. Uh, three of them is 10%, etc. So we often put that percentage column there so that we can see, independent of the sample size, we can see what the pattern is in the numbers. 
So here's another example. The number of computers per household. See if you can make sense out of that visually and see how difficult that is. Here's a good question. Let's look at a table. We put all the possibilities. There weren't any households who had a negative number of computers. Not even know what that means. And there weren't any households that had more than nine computers. And there was only one household that had nine. So we put the numbers from zero to nine as all the possibilities. And then in the frequency column, we write the number of times each of them showed up. These zeros are pretty important. The first zero is actually a value in the data. So a zero on the left hand, here we go, zero computers. That's that person right there, or that family or household right there. So the first zero is, the zero on the left hand side is a value that, it's one of the categories of the variable. And there was one person in this particular case who had zero computers in the house. But the next zero is more interesting. Oops. That just shows you that zero people reported having seven computers. So that seven was put in there to keep the, keep the numbering system continuous and not have any gaps. Now, this has some extra information in it. We have the percentage column right here. So for instance, the number of people who reported exactly three computers, almost a third, 29.3% of the sample reported having three computers in the house. Um, but this cumulative frequency per thing here, uh, CF, sometimes abbreviated CUM, period. So cumulative, that's how it's usually abbreviated. abbreviated. You can see how the numbers grow from the first category, 1, up to the total, 106. So every item here, every entry here, is how many have happened so far from the bottom of the, from the lowest value to, to now. So if you go up here, 61, that means there are 61 um, households that have three or fewer computers. And you just calculate this by taking the frequency of this plus the frequency of anything above it. So this is 4 plus 1, which is everything above it. 30 is 25 plus everything above it, etc. And so then we can have a cumulative percentage too, and we can watch how that percentage grows from 0.9% to a sudden jump from 5 up to almost 30%, and then growing up to 100%. That's very useful for some people. So what if there are lots and lots and lots of categories? then we group things together so that we can get them in a small number of categories so that we can actually visually make sense of them. And we count things, not individual observations, but we count ranges of observations. Now when you specify these ranges, you need to make sure the ranges are equal intervals. Or sometimes you don't do equal, but you do mathematically regular. Like for instance, if you have income, if you did equal intervals, it would be really hard to fit any reasonable income distribution on one page. So sometimes you do logs or exponents or something. And you don't have to worry about that. The point is it's mathematically regular. And you have very clear rules for the highest and lowest points in each interval. And you have extremely clear rules for deciding where every single possible value could fall so that there's never any question of, whether, of, where, of which bin or which category or range some value is in. Now, usually software does this for you, and you don't have to worry about it, but sometimes you have to tweak the parameters and adjust the number of bins, etc. And you absolutely need to know how to read a grouped frequency table. So here's an ungrouped frequency table. Here's a whole bunch of students, and it's really long. We had to stretch it out over four columns on this, on this uh, screen here, because there are so many possible values. We can make this a little bit easier to understand by condensing things into a grouped frequency table. Now this makes sense, and you can even see there's a little lump when things go to two digits versus one, and you can kind of see where the middle is, the most common responses. Now what has been lost is exactly where in each interval or each bin or each range the values are. So right here there are two values between 90 and 94. Are they both 90? Are they both 94? Are they both 93? Is there a 90 and a 93? Is there a 91 and a 93.9? There's no way to tell. We've lost that by grouping things together. What we've gained is an ability to see the pattern. The pattern in how those things are arranged with each other and how those scores are arranged. 
Here's an example of SAT scores, wall O numbers, which is really difficult to make any sense out of, but on your data entry sheet, sometimes things will look like this. A grouped frequency table might look like this. We made some decisions to make each group about 50. Now you have to do weird things like uh, either at the bottom or the top, one of your groups usually has to be slightly larger. This is actually 51. All the rest of them are just 50. Don't worry about that so much. Computers will do that for you. Uh, just worry about making sure the intervals are regular and had, that you can read things. Now, you can even see kind of a bell-shaped distribution happening just from the, the number of, of digits that are being used here. We can tell that this is kind of the middle here. So five people score be two, between 201 and 250, including 201 and 250. And so you don't know where they scored. Maybe they all got 250, or maybe they all got 201. They could be distributed in any way across 201 and 250, but the class intervals are small enough that we probably don't care very much we, because we got to see the pattern here. It's really nice to see this pattern and see that there's kind of a bell-shaped distribution for how people scored and that in general they're scoring around the mean. 500-ish is the mean of the SAT or the old SAT, so old SAT scores. Now here we have some different things. We have relative frequency. All that means is these are proportions of each category instead of percents. Cumulative frequency has a cumulative relative frequency. Again, these are cumulative proportions. They add up to one, not up to 100%. Data matrices are where we hold data for some analysis. And that's how we put data into computers. It's multiple data columns in a computer side by side. Uh, it can be on paper, but usually it's in a computer. Excel works very well for this, but most data programs have some version of this running inside them. So SPSS, when you look at the data, it looks like you're looking at an Excel spreadsheet. If you're analyzing your own data and you have Excel or you have, say, Calc, which is the free version from LibreOffice or, or um, OpenOffice, you can use Excel to hold your data and even analyze an awful lot of your data. I think almost anything we do in this class can be done with Excel if you really work at it. So a, a key characteristic here is that one data matrix is usually for one research study. You don't want to mix and match because you want to be able to say that um, each column is a variable and each row is an individual. And if you mix and match your columns uh, from different studies, then you can't match up the rows across individuals. The computer will usually assume that data matrix is organized this way. So here's a variable. We've measured two characteristics about cars. Now you might say that the third one is the car model number. And maybe technically that's a variable, but we don't usually think of it that way. It's just a numbering system. It's just the identity of each um, of each individual case. Technically, yes, it's a variable, we, but we don't usually think of it that way. Now, each individual case is in a row. So one row will tell you everything that's in the data set about one case. Now, there's only two things to know in this case. There, well, maybe three. What model number the car is, um, what the price was, and what the fuel efficiency was in miles per gallon. That each individual observation is in a cell and then usually at the top of each row we have a variable name now that can be different from the variable name in a general conceptual or, or operational sense because often variable names take several words to describe whereas you don't have space in a data matrix you want to turn things into very small numbers and sometimes we screw with capitalization i like to make things lowercase whenever possible here's an example from my data um, except i actually messed it up but you won't know that one of the things that you'll notice here is there are blanks. In, in R, you will see big capital NA wherever there are blanks. In SPSS, you'll see just like a dot in a cell, like a decimal place or a period. But anyway, a computer always has to represent where there are blanks in the sequence. And that's missing data. So maybe somebody didn't respond to that questionnaire. Or maybe somebody's response to an item was bubbling in two or three bubbles at once, and so you can't tell what's going on there. You also notice that I have very weird abbreviated variable names going on here. And I do that because the definition of this is treatment professional. Is the person a treatment professional, yes or no? And so on with all sorts of other things here. I have a correct version of this at the end of this slide. And we use very strange little data codes sometimes so that you can look at the matrix and you can see quickly who's in which category. So this is ethnicity and WH is white and NW is non-white. So a data matrix can have lots and lots of rows. And we usually start by having raw data 
in our data matrix, not processed data. However, we often process things and leave the processed versions in the data if they're useful to us. So we transform a column of raw values or multiple columns and create a new column. You don't really need to know this, but it will come up when we start working with computerized data and it'll be a little less confused. So for instance, if you have 10 different columns and each of those columns uh, represent the 10 responses to the 10 questions in one questionnaire. Let's say a depression questionnaire with 10 questions on it. Well, you don't you don't usually leave a questionnaire like that as 10 numbers. You usually condense them by taking the average of those 10 depression questions and you say that's your depression score. So you might create a new column in your data matrix that is the average of those 10 columns. And you might call it depression score or something like that. You can standardize things. You can turn them into percents. You can convert the format like you might convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius degrees or body weight and height to BMI or something like that. And so that's pretty standard to put in data matrices as well. So sometimes there's redundant information. The important thing is that in a data matrix, the rows should be an, an individual, an individual case all the way across, and the column should be a variable all the way up and down. So assuming that this entire data set is shown, and I made it so that it actually makes some sense now, see if you can answer these questions. And that will be the end of this slide, or the, this presentation.